I know where there's some, right here in the hall clerk. No, no, my I have a This is by way of an experiment. We have this roller from the uh, Zenith radio uh, built in 19, I don't know, 40 something. And the good news is that the roller is not dented. They usually have a big divot in there when sitting up against the capstan. Um, but it's as hard as a rock, as happens with these things. Now, the guys in the motorcycle business figured out that if you take uh, three parts isopropyl alcohol, add one part wintergreen oil, um, that, and then soak the rubber part in that uh, mixture with the lid on because it outgasses like crazy, uh, what you end up with is a the, uh, apparently, the wintergreen oil soaks into the rubber and rehydrates it, re-softens it over time. And the time can be a day or two or five or a week. Uh, we'll find out. So what I'm going to do is pour out about, oh, what, 30 milliliters. What is that in American? That's about an eighth of a cup or an ounce of... Uh, Isopropyl alcohol. This is this happens to be 90, 91% mostly. Um, I see 70%. I don't know whether 91 is better than 70 or vice versa. Um, it's the first time I've ever done this, so we'll find out. So I'll do an ounce of this stuff, of the alcohol, which is about there. And then I'll... Do about a third of an ounce, if I can, of this wintergreen oil in there as well. And then I'm just eyeballing it, so this isn't going to be terribly accurate. That's about that, I would guess. And then give that a bit of a stir. Drop the roller into a container that I can put a lid on because this will make my whole garage smell like wintergreen oil, which isn't bad, but probably gets tiresome after a while. The point is to have the, uh, the part immersed in that mixture, which it appears to me to be. And put the lid on. And we'll come back and visit this every oh, day or so, see what kind of change we get on that. But I'll keep a, a running tab of what's going on with this and uh, summer up, summarize it at the end. Okay, it's day two of our experiment. This uh, idler wheel has been soaking in this uh, isopropyl alcohol uh, wintergreen oil solution for a couple of days now. So let's take it out and see how the rubber feels. I think the theory is that the isopropyl alcohol carries the wintergreen oil into the rubber, uh, thereby, uh, hmm, oh, the first challenge is getting it out of the container, I guess. It's added some interesting discoloration to the the liquid. I don't know whether that's just stuff coming off the uh, idler wheel because of its age or history or what. Don't know. I don't know. There it is. Oh, it actually feels softer. That's interesting. It does feel like it's softening up. This is what we did last time. Oh, it's it sounds like rubber now. It was kind of a clunk uh, before. So boy, it seems like this might be working. 
it feels uh, like it has grab now, and it didn't used to. Huh. Okay. Well, I'll give it a couple more days and see what happens. Very nice. I can feel I can compress it now. I couldn't compress it at all before. So, this is showing some promise. Excellent. Let's see if we can get it back in there without drowning myself. All right. All right. Get my wire off. As I said, this is the second day of it soaking, and we'll give it another two days. And then I think uh, we'll call that done for this experiment and see how this goes. This is day five of our experiment uh, with the uh, isopropyl alcohol and the wintergreen oil. And our idler wheel has been soaking in here for five days today. And I think this will be the last day of immersion. I'm going to take it out of here. So pardon my hands. And remove it from the uh, solution, if I can. <clears throat> Cap that so I don't have to smell it too much. Not that it smells bad, it's just overwhelming. How much it smells. It's an essential oil, and essential oils are very uh, volatile and they'll fill up a room with themselves. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> it uh, looks fine. I'm seeing this, there was this loose rubber around the edge. It was just folded over uh, during manufacturing. And that's even swollen up a little bit. Um, it feels to me much more pliable than it did well, it didn't feel pliable at all in the first place, but now it really feels pliable. And we'll give it the tap test. <clears throat> See if it sounds any different. It uh, just sounds like rubber now. There's no clunking. All right. As I said uh, last time, it feels grabbier. It feels more like rubber ought to feel when you want it to uh, take hold of the inside of the platter. So we'll try this. Uh, our experiment has ended. Um, it feels like it might be successful. We won't really know until this gets back on the turntable, which I am right now reassembling. So that's next. Where are we with this thing? I have cleaned under here. Surprised to find that this was all copper plated, which is nice, I guess. Anyway, I cleaned off all the sprockets, uh, took the chain off, cleaned it, lubed all the axles I could get to, uh, checked out the motor, replaced all the wiring that was cracked, which was all the plastic wiring, um, this had a big, rigid, well, now rigid, it was probably flexible at one time, but very rigid, uh, yellowing plastic tube, all this bundle of wires were in that. I had to cut that off to replace a couple of power leads that went uh, from the radio chassis to the uh, motor. Uh, checked out the motor, took it apart, lubed it, and now... As far as I can tell, I've got this back together the way it goes. So now onto the top. And what's to do here is um, put the potentially refurbished um, idler wheel on. Um, this piece just sits on here anyway, like that. Um, oh, there's a, no, no, no. got to clean up all the plastic bits, which I haven't done yet, and then 
missing something. The missing part shows itself. Anyway, this fits in this hole right here, and I just stretched the heck out of that spring. So now I'm going to have to either replace it or figure out how to shrink it back down to its original size. Rats. Ah, should be more careful. I need to be more careful. Okay, I screwed up here. This um, spring, this spring fits on this little giz right here and attaches to this hole right here and uh, pulls the, gently pulls the idler wheel, which sits on top of it, against the uh, rim of the platter. And this had fallen on the floor and I reached down and to pull it up because I didn't realize, and what I didn't realize was the spring had hooked into the carpet. So now, instead of a, an expansion spring, I turned it into something of a compression spring. So the question is, what do we do about that? I, I don't have one like this. It's not a terribly, I don't know how many ounces or however you measure this stuff. It's not a terribly str strong spring. So I found one. I could not find an expansion spring with about the same force, but I found this one at the hardware store. This is a compression spring. And my question to myself is, can I turn a compression spring into an expansion spring? In other words, can I recompress this one um, so that it is uh, about, well, about what? About a half an inch shorter, maybe even a little more. Um, and the only way I know to do that, and, and there's no guarantee it'll work, the only way I know to do that is to put this on a form, compress it, and then uh, heat it up as uniformly as I can, and allow it to cool, and that will uh, cause the spring to reform in, in closer to the shape I want, I think. So I'm about to try that. I've got a steel rod. I think it's steel, yeah. Steel rod. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm going to put a uh, washer on there. I'm going to put my test spring on there because I don't want to screw up a um, good one yet. And another washer on the end of that. I'll uh, put a clamp down here to hold this in place. And then hopefully. Oh, I should do it there. Yeah, that's okay. I'll put one, that one there and push this one up till I've compressed that spring quite a bit. About there. It's uh, warped when it's compressed, but I guess I don't care. Probably, well, yeah, I guess I don't care. So what I'm going to do is heat this up until it's pretty red hot uh, and then cool it and see what happens. Okay, we'll see. I don't know enough about metallurgy. Is that, is that the right word? Yeah, metallurgy to tell whether I should quench that quickly or let it just cool down. I think I'll just let it cool down. We'll see what happens. Well, staying compressed. I guess that's something. Okay, so now it's an extension spring. That seems to that seems to have worked. I mean, it's it's I've probably destroyed some property of this spring that its manufacturer uh, built into it. However, it uh, does 
uh, does still have spring except in the opposite direction. So <clears throat> now we'll try it on this one. This is the original and I can't imagine being able to find one of these anywhere. Yeah, if I can get it down that far, I think that'll work for me. Um, let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. Check the results of our grand experiment. That's again stays compressed. That's a good sign. Um, this goes right there. It connects to that little tooth here, and then to that hole right there, and it slides back and forth. So it looks right. It looks okay. Well, all right. I'll continue and we'll see how it turns out. Okay, the idler wheel's back on. Um, the spring tensioner seems to be working okay. It's hard, you, you won't really be able to tell until the platter's on because what the spring does is pull. Uh, there's kind of a uh, theoretical V right here. The platter edge is here, the, the motor is there, and this gets sprung into that space. Then the motor turns the, the idler wheel, which turns the platter. So we won't really know whether that spring is tight enough or too tight until the platter goes on. I presume this play is there so you can get the platter off uh, should you need to service the, the unit. So that's where the idler wheel is. I'll continue putting this back together and uh, we'll give it a try. Actually, I may just put the platter on as it sits right now and uh, hardwire some AC into here to see if it turns okay. Um, in fact, I may do that even before I put the platter on just to make sure this is all, all working all right. Not convinced about the yeah there's clearance under there I guess yeah it's okay um, so that's what's next all right I've got it uh, motors in cables have been replaced um, I've got this switch this is the manual auto and off switch set to manual um, don't look here and don't look over here because you should never try this at home. You'll kill yourself. Um, but I wanted to see if the engine worked, the motor worked. And we'll try that right now. And it does. And it's so pleasingly quiet. So if I push the uh, idler wheel in a little bit. It does spin, but it's also got a rumble. Um, and I kept talking about there not being a divot in the uh, idler wheel when I first looked at it. And I suspect there is, actually. And again, we won't know whether the spring adjustment here is in the right place yet until we put on the platter. But it's definitely rumbly. I can feel it. Um, the, 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 the 78 RPM rumble. So this this uh, wintergreen oil and alcohol cure may soften it so that it grabs enough, but it looks to me like it's not taken out uh, what I missed before, which is obviously a dent, an indentation in that wheel. Um, yeah, so 
All right, the next step is to put on the platter. See if it turns. Platter is on. I made sure to, to uh, get the uh, idler wheel out of the way before I set it down on there. And uh, everything is the way it was a moment ago. I should turn on power and we should see that turn. It looks pretty good. It's applying some torque. Um, I suspect that our spring, the spring that I shortened, isn't quite short enough yet. I think it should be pulling that, pulling the idler wheel in harder against the motor and the, uh, the motor capstan and the uh, platter. But it's turning. Now I'll have to figure out a way to see how fast it's turning. And it's got pretty good. I mean, it's this stuff is falling off over here like crazy. Um, the spray on felt. It has, it, it's relatively powerful. I mean, it's not hugely powerful, but it's relatively powerful. Um, so I may have to settle for some rumble until I can replace that idler wheel. Uh, I thought for a moment we had a magic bullet, but of course there is no such thing. Anyway, we're making good progress. I need to shorten this spring uh, a bit more. But rather than putting it under the torch, I'm going to um, do it the old-fashioned way. Cut the end off. And stretch out our new end for it. Right there. I may have to cut off that amount too. I expect heating it took away some of the resilience that the spring would normally have. Yeah, that's that's pulling better. It's pulling. It will. It will pull the idler wheel into the into the motor a little bit better. So I think I'll leave that right there. Put this back on. See if that starts up the platter without my having to spin it. Okay, everything else is the same. Yeah, so that starts up there. So shortening the spring was the right thing to do. Um, in terms of uh, that spring having being that critical, I don't think it is. I, I mean, it's critical in that it holds the motor, uh, the, it holds the idler wheel up against the motor shaft and the platter. Um, but its exact tension probably really doesn't matter that much. So it's turning, it's noisy. Um, and again, I think I'm going to have to find a new idler wheel. It's fairly generic, I, I hope. <laughs> Probably somebody out there can sell me one right now. So I'll go looking for one of those. But this all has to work together, of course. And uh, you may recall there's a, on this sprocket, there is a synchronizing arrow right there. And there's a corresponding synchronizing arrow, although the cleaning process almost destroyed it right there, um, right in here. And that arrow has to line up with that arrow when this 
bit of the clutch drops down into that slot right there. So I've got the chain loose. I'm actually going to remove it and then turn everything so that it uh, all syncs up, if I'm lucky. We'll see. We'll see. So once I've got it into position, I'll show you what that looks like. I reinforced the uh, timing marks with a, a pen so I could see them more easily. So now this sprocket is lined up with this timing mark and this clutch uh, piece right here just dropped into that slot right there in the timing wheel. So now I can uh, attach the, the um, chain and uh, should be ready to go. And tension it, of course. Tensioner is right here, but we should be ready to go. I have uh, applied a light coat of uh, white lithium grease to all the sprockets and here and there on the chain. Um, it should, looks like it should be okay. Onward. I was just oiling the, um, the, uh, the main shaft that carries the platter because it still felt very stiff to me. And I wanted to show you one of the best investments I ever made for uh, working on stuff like this is this, I guess it's a syringe, it's an oil dropper used by clockmakers, um, clock repairmen, repair people. Uh, it has a long needle, hollow tip, and you just squeeze it and a drop of oil, just a drop of oil comes out. And that's, uh, that's clock oil in there, so it's not very heavy. And it uh, works pretty well to loosen up stiff, stiff um, bearings. Um, so, if you work on these, you might want to get one of these. <laughs>